Nancy is currently the director of the Oregon National Primate Research Center in, in Beaverton, where she is also a senior scientist, uh, as well as a senior scientist at the Vaccine and Gene Therapy Institute uh, in, in Portland. Uh, in addition, she's a professor of molecular microbiology and immunology at the Oregon Health and Science University and a member of the Seattle Biomedical Research Institute. But Nancy is a, a native of North Carolina and, and received uh, her bachelor's as well as her PhD at the University of North Carolina, but I should mention that she went to high school, at least for a year or so, at Foothill High right here in Tustin. Um, but uh, I guess uh, wound up back in North Carolina where she did her undergraduate work and her graduate work, and then went and did a postdoc at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, uh, eventually uh, winding up at Chiron for about a 10-year stint, where she uh, rose to the level of director of virology at that institute. Excuse me, at that um, uh, private company, Chiron. Nancy uh, then moved down to Seattle, for where she, for a short time, worked with Bristol Myers Squibb and then for a much longer time at the Seattle Biomedical Research Institute and was associated with the University of Washington there as well. And she remained there until uh, 2007 uh, where she moved down to Portland taking on her current job as the director of the primate lab uh, in Oregon. Nancy is certainly internationally and nationally recognized as an expert on the HIV envelope and on neutralizing antibody responses. She's served on a number of national committees, advisory boards. She's an associate editor of uh, AIDS Research and Human Retroviruses, and is also on the editorial board of a number of other journals, including the Journal of Virology. Antibody control of HIV infection and Nancy Hagelin are almost synonymous. Um, she has doggedly pursued this area of research with an eye on vaccine development, really since her days at Chiron, uh, dating back to the mid-1980s, and has made a number of uh, key findings in, in this area. And I should say that she persisted even through what could be called the dark days of antibody research when the uh, entire HIV vaccinology field was directed at finding CD8 cells that, control, that could be elicited by a vaccine and control uh, HIV infection. Uh, something we've since learned is not likely to ever occur very effectively. Um, but Nancy persisted, uh, in, and the pendulum has indeed swung the other way, and her ideas about uh, HIV antibodies have really uh, prevailed lately and are likely to prove correct. So again, we're very pleased to have uh, Nancy, uh, a true expert in the area of HIV immunology, and she'll be speaking on the role of, the role of antibodies in HIV transmission. Thank you so much, Sean. And do I need a microphone? Is this important? No. Yes, yes. Yes, it's important. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is it on? Now it is. How's that? Can you tell the difference? Yeah. You can. Okay. I can speak up. But, uh, well, uh, I'm just delighted to be here. As uh, as Don mentioned, I, I was uh, living here uh, quite a long time ago. It was actually 45 years ago when I was a, a student in high school the first year that Foothill High School opened, 1965. So that, that kind of dates me. But um, I also remember that there was nothing here at the time. Uh, UC Irvine was um, an idea, I think. And it's amazing to see what has been wrought from this beautiful land uh, made even more beautiful for biomedical research. And it's, it's really a pleasure to be back in California, especially after an extremely wet spring. And by wet, I mean like four and a half inches of rain in May alone. So we, we are just getting inundated, and we're looking forward to our summertime. Uh, this is a, a photograph of some of the rhesus macaques, two of rhesus macaques that are in our corrals at uh, ONPRC, which is what we call the, the primate center. Uh, many of our animals are born in, in natural settings like this in corrals and grow up until they're about age four when they're assigned to, uh, to studies or to breeding colonies. And uh, this is just an example of a mother and baby uh, the baby stayed with their mother for at least a year. And I just thought that this would be emblematic because of my interest in mother-to-child transmission. And you'll see why as I get through the seminar. So I look forward to uh, your thoughts at the end of this. And I'll, I'll have a, quite a few slides, but I'm, I'm, they're mostly just single-point slides. So um, 
I know you understand the importance of studying HIV because of the continuing pandemic. This slide is really presented here as a means of seeing that despite the discovery of antiretroviral therapy, or ART, and heart, the number of people living with HIV continues to rise. We don't have a graph from the latest 2008 report. We're expecting another report from uh, UNAIDS this summer. But this uh, graph has, although it may be flattening out a little bit, uh, I understand that, uh, that with the economic downturn, the uh, availability of uh, ART in the developing world uh, continues to be in jeopardy. And the consequence of this is that not only adults living with HIV, but the children that are born to these infected mothers and in 2007, there were about 17.7 .7 million women and 2 million children. 90% of the cases in children resulting in these infections and death, 90% of these uh, cases are mother-to-child transmission. So we'd like to understand how to limit that, either with drugs or I'm going to try to persuade you with antibodies. Uh, again, uh, all of you are very familiar with the, the timeline of HIV infection, disease, and immunity, uh, seeing uh, in the first few weeks, a peak in viremia, which is then cleared and thought to be concomitant with the development of the adaptive immune response, including cytotoxic <coughs> T cells. And what we study, of course, is HIV-specific antibody in the blue line. And importantly, it, uh, although the antibody rises fairly quickly after infection, neutralizing antibody or antibody that can inhibit virus in vitro by other sorts of assays seems to take significant periods of time, and in fact, uh, often is not seen for months after infection. And we, we don't really understand why that is the case, and this is a, a very active area of investigation these days. Um, one of the reasons that, that uh, antibodies may be slow to develop is that the HIV envelope protein, the most interesting protein on the planet, as far as I'm concerned, uh, is a very tricky protein. It has a lot of flexibility, it has a lot of variation, and it has a, a huge cloak of carbohydrate all over it. It exists in two subunits that are not covalently attached to each other. It's a problem. But, uh, and as shown in this diagram, uh, the uh, business of the viral protein is to bind to CD4 and to the co-receptors, uh, usually CCR5, shown here in this cartoon, where the, um, the loops of the protein that are involved in CCR5 binding haven't been mapped. It's so uh, floppy, if you will a very dynamic protein that changes significantly in, in its shape during <coughs> this event of binding and then ultimately fusing the viral membrane to the cell membrane and leading to the rest of the infection. Very important uh, areas of study, but what we're interested in, in in my lab is how to block this, this event from taking place. And one of the ways that we've done this is to study HIV-infected people and infected animals infected with uh, various viruses. Um, <coughs> What is known about HIV envelope and neutralizing antibodies is that most people do have them. Unless the virus is extraordinarily well controlled, as with a, an elite controller, uh, nearly all individuals develop neutralizing antibodies. And about 25% develop what we call broadly neutralizing antibodies. I'm not going to be talking about this subject much more in this lecture, but just to, to mention that uh, this is of great interest to those of us looking at vaccine approaches because it's important to understand how to make an antibody that can recognize a virus that's different from the one you're infected with. Since in any vaccine situation, you're going to be exposed to a virus that's clearly different from the vaccine, just by definition. There are a few people, about two to three percent of, of individuals infected with HIV that can really recognize and neutralize a huge range of viruses, and these are extremely interesting people that a lot of us are studying. But again, I'm not going to, um, to cover that in great detail. One of the things that we've learned, and one of the ways we've learned that this takes place is that many people in the field who have been looking at the immune response and have cloned monoclonal antibodies from HIV-infected people have shown that these broad neutralizing antibodies do exist, they exist in Rare, rare subjects, and that these are directed, if they are very broad, typically to conserved elements, the same conserved elements that the envelope needs in order to get into the cell. And therefore, this represents a weakness that uh, envelope has. And I mentioned there, the many mechanisms that the virus uses to cover up these regions, both three-dimensionally uh, by burying the, the binding sites, 
in the interior of the protein as well as cloaking the entire uh, envelope with carbohydrate. So again, those are our main uh, vaccine issues. Uh, we, we have been interested in what the natural, uh, what is the information that exists in infection that can help us understand what the role of antibodies might be, especially in mother-to-child transmission. And this uh, kind of cartoon uh, illustrates the antibodies that exist in the infected mother and how uh, certain of these antibodies are, are directed to different regions of, of the virus are very effectively transferred to the baby during pregnancy. IgG1, uh, IgG in general is, is transferred very well across the placenta and it's known that there are correlative studies that strongly suggest that these antibodies are not only present but they are correlated with lower transmission. And uh, some very nice work from Julie Overbaugh's lab, this Wu et al. paper, showed that the transferred, transmitted variants in uh, Kenya from mother to baby are actually the neutralization escape variants from the mother, suggesting strongly that the rest of those variants are actually neutralized by, by the mother's maternal neutralizing antibodies. Um, other studies have looked at the, the type of antibody that uh, may be important in this Event. And not to ignore the cellular immunity, there is also evidence that CTL responses are stronger in non-transmitters, and clearly there is evidence for HIV-specific T cells, CD8 positive T cells in the breast milk. So suggesting that this this is also potentially playing a role. Um, we, uh, being non-human primate modelers, would like to be able to ask questions that really cannot easily be addressed in the clinic, and that's really why we've turned to non-human primate models for AIDS. And again, I'm sure you're very familiar with these models. They typically, uh, it's not just one model, it's a given species of primate shown here on the left, the different species of Asian macaque. And the viruses that are used are viruses derived from the African animals, sooty mangabees, for example, African greens, where the virus is endemic and non-pathogenic in those hosts. But then when transferred to a different species of macaque, these Asian macaques causes a disease very much like AIDS. And we, these models have been invaluable to us in helping us understand establishing Koch's postulate and un understanding transmission routes and doses that are needed for infection, tissue pen penetration, and, and these other issues. I'm going to emphasize the loss of GALT in just a few minutes. Um, in terms of models for mother to child transmission or perinatal transmission, uh, there are a number of different ways that people have attempted to look at this type of transmission, um, and these include infecting the dam or the mother, where, and I'll show you some data from our lab that we've published in this um, way, and various other means. Um, we've uh, tended to favor uh, either the infected dam or the direct oral inoculation that would, that would um, be a natural model for acquisition of the virus by drinking uh, during birth or via breast milk. And here's an, another uh, baby in one of our colonies uh, nursing. The work by Don Sedora and his colleagues uh, several years ago, in, uh, published in 2004, was really seminal in helping us understand how well the virus is transmitted from the oral uh, mucosa to the rest of the body and how rapidly that takes place. And this colored coded uh, diagram. I, I love this publication because it helps you understand in a, a color-coded way the blue tissues, as, as is shown here on the bottom, there uh, are no PCR uh, positive reactions. The orange is 50% of the samples were positive and um, the red is greater than 50% of the PCR uh, reactions were positive. So clearly in this infection you see um, on the day one the infection of being oral is, is getting into these tissues and already quickly to these lymph nodes, and as time goes by, two days and then four days, you can see that the virus is then spreading to the gut and to the rest of the lymph node system, uh, resulting in, in uh, pathogenesis and uh, loss of gulp tissue. And these, this uh, figure is actually taken from the uh, Jason Brenchley's paper in humans showing HIV negative and HIV positive comparisons of the gulp tissue and showing how the uh, gut associated lymphoid tissue is, is essentially eliminated in HIV positive infection. Uh, this was originally observed in 1998 in the SIV system by uh, Satya Dandekar and her colleagues. 
and we now know that these, uh, again, this suggests that the SIV system is a good model. Uh, we have actually moved to studying not only SIV, but more recently we also study SHIVs. And I wanted to take a little bit of time to summarize for you some of the data from uh, our work as, as well as uh, other work in the literature to help you understand some of the questions that have been addressed using the SHIV model. Now, the SHIV is a uh, chimeric laboratory-derived virus that consists of the HIV envelope embedded in the SIV genome, as shown in the cartoon here. And this uh, concept was originally um, really conceived by um, Masanori Hayami in Japan, and it was first published by uh, Joe Sadrowski and, and others at Harvard, and Hayami then a bit later, but really, um, Hayami was the father of shivs, and there have been many additional shivs since that time. I note that the discovery of CCR5 occurred in 1997, and since that time, there's been a focus to clone envelopes from CCR5 utilizing HIV strains, because we think those are the most relevant. SIV uses CCR5 exclusively, and the current shivs, and the ones I'll be talking about, are CCR5 uh, shivs, uh, one uh, made by uh, Cecilia Chingmayer and Janet Harrells. Um, these shivs are very valuable because they bear the HIV envelope, and that allows us to ask questions about the neutralization of HIV-1. And the reason this is important, uh, or, or frustrating, I guess would be one way to put it, is that uh, although SIV and HIV uh, use the same receptors and co-receptors, they do not share sequence, sufficient sequence homology to be cross-neutralized by one another. So it's not possible to use HIV-specific neutralizing monoclonal antibodies against SIV and vice versa. So that's really the rationale for studying shivs. So now I just want to walk you through some slides, and I've tried to highlight in each case the box that I want you to look at that's associated with the publication at the top. So the purpose of this exercise is to help you see that originally, as a field, we um, utilized shivs to ask questions about polyclonal IgG, so-called HIVIG, or HIV immune globulin, derived from HIV-infected people, or individual monoclonals, 2F5, 2G12, these are two monoclonals that recognize different parts of envelope um, that are highly conserved from, from uh, strain to strain, and uh, using an IV challenge. And so when uh, this group, uh, John Mascola and his colleagues did this study with SHIV 89.6, which was a, an, an X4 SHIV, and they utilized a, a dose of uh, 40 uh, animal infectious doses, uh, they got protection in three out of six animals. And then when they um, used the same dose of IgG and challenged by the vaginal route, they used a much higher dose uh, of actually a, a, a virus to get infection in controls and protected four out of five animals with the same dose of, an, of uh, antibody. So this, this clearly shows you can get protection. And what's important about these studies is these uh, antibodies were given intravenously, so this tells you that um, given that the challenge was intervaginally, in this case, antibodies, IgGs, get to the mucosal surface, and they can protect against mucosal challenge. The next study was one that we participated in with uh, Malcolm Martin and his colleagues, and there were, uh, it was a fairly complex study where um, two different doses of virus were, virus were tested by the IV route, and we used immune globulin from chimpanzees infected with HIV, so-called CHIVIC. And we tried two different doses, 230 mg per kg or 25 mg per kg. The high dose protected one animal, the low dose protected none. But then when we tested with a lower challenge dose, the lower dose of CHIVIC was successful in protecting animals. This is a, a very small study, but yet an important one. Um, Ruth Ruprecht and her colleagues uh, tested a VPU, uh, CCR5 using SHIV at a fairly low dose uh, challenge. They tried IV and orally, and in this case, looking at adults versus infants, and they're starting to see protection just with monoclonals, again, mixtures of monoclonals directed to different regions. So um, uh, SF162P3 uh, was tested uh, with a, a high dose uh, challenge with just one monoclonal, and that was uh, work that Ann Hessel and Dennis Burton published uh, recently, and they uh, protected three out of five animals. And similarly with uh, Shiv-Bal, which is another CCR5 virus, uh, 
uh, high dose intrarectal challenge, pr pretty good protection with a, with a low dose of individual monoclonals directed to conserved regions. So I hope you can see from these studies that yes, you can get protection with, with antibodies that are given in advance of the virus. And uh, this is another study that was uh, published uh, several years ago that, that shows the dose response uh, quite clearly, I think. Uh, all of these were vaginal challenges. You see the dose of the virus is quite high, but the amount of antibody varies and it's starting at 25 mg per kg and dropping down to one. And you can see the level of protection is going from high to low. So clearly you need antibody. And what happened when these studies were published was people said, ha, see? Antibodies are never going to work because look how much antibody you have to have. There's no way we can generate this kind of response with a vaccine. And actually, I think this is how we got into trouble in the vaccine field with antibodies. But uh, I hope after today you'll feel more heartened by this. So passive immunity can protect. I've said that. And the in vitro neutralization that we're measuring correlates well. These are neutralizing antibodies. They may <coughs> have other functions, but we know for sure they can neutralize. And um, there's a rough estimate of how much you need to block infection in, in vivo in these primate models. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that, that in the case of transmission, you can, even though the animal may not be protected, you can actually see some, some cases lower plasma virus load or protection from CD4 uh, counts. And that's, that was intriguing to us, and that's really what we followed up with uh, and I want to talk to you about today. And importantly, I'm not going to spend a lot of time discussing this, but I'm delighted to be collaborating with Don Forthall and, and his colleagues uh, on ADCC and ADCBI uh, antibodies. Uh, they've done a couple of studies, one of which we, we collaborated with, um, to show that there uh, is limitation of transmission to newborn macaques in using antibodies that have other specificities and other activities other than neutralization. So this is a rich area. We need to understand how these antibodies actually work. Uh, finally, I want to point to a study that was published last summer from Dennis Burton's group again, uh, showing that much lower doses than had been tried before of antibodies, antibody B12, which is directed to the CD4 binding site, a co very conserved region, um, were effective in limiting infection. And the way they did this experiment was to, to dose animals repeatedly with low doses of B12. Previously uh, shown here, the high dose studies that were protective were at 25 mg per kg, but these low dose studies, they were dosing at 25 times lower, one mg per kg, very low doses repeatedly every week. And then what they did was to challenge the animals vaginally with low dose virus. So we in the field have been trying to get away from high dose intravenous challenge and trying to replicate more closely what might be going on with humans, trying to model that. And this um, study then showed that the controls were very quickly infected after just a couple of exposures, whereas the, uh, these two groups that received B12 or a mutant of B12 that lacks FC binding uh, were more effective and required much more exposure to virus in order to get some of or all of the animals infected. So these, these studies uh, were very important because they opened the door to lower levels of antibodies being useful and I want you to remember that dose because we're going to come back to that. So, ending the introduction here, <laughs> neutralizations uh, significantly lower than those described there at or below those described in people. So this is, this is good, the first really good news. Um, and the importance of FC binding is also uh, critically there. Uh, this led to, I uh, was lucky to be able to write a commentary on this article and another one published at the same time with Vanessa Hirsch. And she and I um, pointed out that uh, our view was that th this is a model for what may be going on, that in, in the case of very low levels of neutralizing antibodies shown on the top in scenario A, they're insufficient to block infection and you get divergence of the virus and all of the pathogenic consequences. And in contrast, if you can set up a situation where you have persistent low level antibodies, um, much lower than we had previously uh, predicted, then you can actually get virus control. So um, the other study that was published at the same time was from Phil Johnson, and that was a, uh, an engineered antibody that was actually transduced into animals in vivo. And if you have time to read this, uh, these uh, studies, they're, they're very exciting studies. So what, did, what have we contributed? Well, uh, my group's been interested in passive <coughs> studies for a, a long time because I already told you we, we're very frustrated in the vaccine field. We don't know how to make immunogens that can elicit neutralizing antibodies 
at the time we thought we would need to make them at the level that I was describing, this super high level, we actually don't even know how to make antibodies that can, uh, sorry, excuse me, uh, antigens that can elicit antibodies even at this lower level at this time. So we've used passive studies to, as, as others have, to try to understand what the effects would be of these lower doses um, of natural antibodies that are generated during <coughs> infection in protection. So if we could generate them, what would they do? And this is a single slide from a study we published in 2004 that was done in the SIV model. And I'm showing you some data here from three different treatment groups. One is untreated at the top. The middle group received normal IgG. And the bottom received SIV IgG, or CIVIC, just like the HIVIC. It's polyclonal IgG purified from SIV-infected animals and not infectious. And uh, we used that to add back to these animals. And we asked what happened when we gave animals this material as a therapeutic dose, and we gave it to them on day one and day 14. And what we found, as graphed here, not, not surprisingly you see that, that uh, here's the passively transferred material, and it decays over time. This black line is actually uh, an animal that was not infected with SIV, showing the kinetics of decay are identical, whether you have the infection or not. And then here's binding antibodies starting to come up. So, uh, two animals were apparently not, not infected. And then if you uh, look at the other uh, controls, you see that the, the um, untreated and normal IgG groups um, actually make binding antibody, what we call de novo antibodies, pretty quickly. But the civic group is taking its time in making the de novo responses. But it, when we looked at the neutralizing antibodies, the exact opposite event took place. It takes forever, IV, that is, around 30 weeks to get a decent titer in these control animals, a uh, neutralizing titer. But these specific treated animals, actually three of these guys made it very rapidly within 12 weeks. And they, they don't have much detectable binding antibody. So that tells you something that's different about the quality of the antibody response in these treated animals. And importantly, these animals went on to sustain this very, very low virus load for five years. So no other treatment. Uh, the problem with the study was it's SIV, and we only had really these three responders. So we, we really wanted to repeat this study and understand better this concept, potentially, if it's true, of accelerating. Sorry, Nancy, yes, please. You. So these are two injections of day one or zero, and then day 14. Day one. Day zero, we infected them, and then and day, day one. one. And then 14. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then it decays. And what you inject are uh, ammonia sulfate. Uh, precipitate? Sorry. No, we uh, purified using protein G. So it's so I IgG. IgG. IgG only. Mm -hmm. And do you know in those IgGs what is the proportion of antibodies that are to HIV? We, we don't. We've made efforts to estimate that in previous work that I've done. Uh, and it looks like, generally speaking, it's about 5%. But we have no idea what the proportion of neutralizing antibodies or antibodies with other functions. But those come from infected individuals. That's correct. That's correct. So infected animals and infected people do a great job making neutralizing antibodies. If you could have those antibodies at the time, this is, this is modeling post-exposure prophylaxis, basically. Needle stick. Yeah, you have to give them a break at the beginning. Mm -hmm. That's in right. Order for them to That's exactly right. Response. And you have a short window of opportunity. And yes. a number of groups, including yes. ours, have, have looked at that window. It's just very short. It's within the first week for sure. So we were encouraged by this, but we wanted to explore this accelerated antibody question, and we wanted to ask if uh, mother to child transmission might be an important place to look for this. So again, I've mentioned we use this SHIV SF162P3. Just a few characteristics about this virus. It's highly replication competent and pathogenic, but there's no drastic loss of CD4 cells. It, to me, it looks like HIV in people. There's vaginal mucosal transmission, so we reasoned that this would be a good virus to look at for transmission from the mother to the baby, vaginal transmission the other way, if you will, uh, and uh, CCR5, et cetera. So uh, we did some experiments with a perinatal model where we infected pregnant dams in the middle of their second trimester. And the goal of this experiment, we took 10 animals and infected them. And we wanted to see this happen, where we would have a peak of viremia that would resolve, and that antibodies, including neutralizing antibodies, would have a chance to develop by the time of birth. 
And uh, if we were to then follow the babies and the mothers for six months to a year, we would then determine whether we saw transmission either in utero or interpartum during birth or by suckling. So we left the babies with the mothers. This is not an intervention study. It's just a pathogenesis study. Um, and these are some of the questions that we wanted to, to ask ourselves whether we could determine. So in this study, and I'm not showing you the data from this study, just the conclusions because we've published this study, what we found was that we got transmission of, in four out of nine infants, evidence for a transmission in four out of nine about the same as humans. Human transmission rate is about 35%. With the 10 animals, it's not too bad. Uh, we saw all three modes of transmission, so evidence for that. Um, in terms of immunity, we could measure the antibodies getting to the babies very efficiently. When the babies were born, nice high levels of binding and neutralizing antibodies. And we could see in those animals that were not infected, nice decay of that passive transfer. Interesting to me, uh, IgG is very efficiently transferred and the breast milk didn't seem to make any difference in the monkey model. So I think that's a, a, something that will have to be studied, more, uh, is better studied in, in humans where you can actually get uh, milk samples. We, we were not able to get milk samples. And we found that the infected infants responded very quickly. And they made IgM and IgG, so we, we caught the ID, uh, both of those responses. Um, the outcome was that the in utero animal progressed very rapidly, and then we saw some infants that were negative at birth, and they, um, but they controlled the virus. So that was really interesting. But you've already seen that we, we had very few transmissions, and so we really couldn't make much of statistical value out of this it was an extremely valuable study because it helped us see the transmission, it helped us understand uh, how much antibody was present in the babies at the time of birth. It allows us to model for this. And I just want to mention one quick result, which is that we, we actually had a few animals that were negative for virus, but they were positive, seropositive. So we knew they were infected. And this result is similar to, we called it occult infection. Um, because this has been observed in HIV-infected exposed seronegative partners by Tofu Zhu and uh, his colleagues at the University of Washington. They've done some beautiful studies in humans, and then this is a study that was published um, in 2003 showing different macaques. And all the different colors here are vaccinated and various uh, 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 virus load samples from um, the PDMC in SIV-infected animals of various types. and then. What he found was that there's a population of animals that are very, very well controlling their virus, and they have extremely low. We're talking about um, on the order of four, you know, two, two to six logs lower virus. So it's possible that that in mother-to-child transmission, there are babies that are born with extremely low virus loads, and they're controlling. But if we really want to study this, we have to have a way to do interventional studies. So we switched to doing oral infection of newborn animals, uninfected newborns, and we use the same virus. And the study I'm going to describe to you today is one that we're very excited about, which uh, shows um, an exciting uh, trend of the um, antibodies in having an effect on these animals. So we had four groups in this study, a no IgG group as before. These were actually our titration animals where we studied the virus direct oral inoculation and we figured out what dose to use. Uh, then we treated three groups, normal IgG, and two different types of uh, neutralizing antibodies that I will describe to you in a moment. These were the doses that the animals got. And the design of the experiment was to study these animals for about six months. We took them a, a few weeks after birth. We gave them the IgG. Now this is a prevention study. So we're trying to model now what the baby would look like on the day of birth if they were going to be infected during the process of birth or shortly thereafter. So the IgG goes in and then the virus, different from our SIV study. So the oral exposure, we just let them drink the virus, <coughs> and then we studied them. And we also vaccinated them with hepatitis B to measure immune responses. Because we were trying to determine whether we saw a more rapid development of antibodies and neutralizing antibodies, we needed a, an internal control, <coughs> and that served for that. So our predicted outcomes were, are on this slide. So with the no IgG, you would expect to see high virus load, a nice response to hepatitis B, and then measuring neutralizing antibodies would take some time. And similarly, with the normal IgG, we would expect that to go in and then decay. In fact, we can't even measure it because we don't, it doesn't, there's nothing to measure it against. Uh, we tried, but we didn't, we didn't really see that. Um, and we would expect the exact same outcome from that. 
the other two groups were interesting to us because we're comparing what we call mismatched IgG with matched IgG. Now, this is interesting to me because there's this question of if you have a lot of binding antibody, but it doesn't neutralize, is it still useful? So we, the mismatched IgG was material taken from animals infected with a different ship, and the matched IgG was taken from animals infected with the same ship. And what I hope you can see here is that the, the matched IgG, the expected outcome is we would hope to see a reduction in viremia, as we did with our SIV study, and then a more, a more rapid development of neutralizing antibodies. And that is what we got, but I want to show you the data. It's pretty exciting to us. So the IgG that we prepared, I just want to show you a little bit of data to show you we can purify IgG. So uh, the important point was that the, the matched IgG has a high titer against the virus that we're challenging with and a low titer against a different virus and vice versa. And, and the way we determine uh, neutralizing antibodies is to uh, make viruses that we can test. Unfortunately, the Shiv P3 virus is very difficult to grow in vitro, so we tend to use pseudoviruses that represent the prevalent envelopes. And well, these pseudoviruses are made by co-transfecting the, the full-length envelope along with a, a clone that is a full-length clone that's missing envelope. And this then makes a one-round virus. And then this pseudovirus is then used to infect a, an, a cell that is a, an indicator cell that makes luciferase once it binds and we measure relative light units. This is a very uh, common assay that is used in our field. And I, I feel comfortable using this for comparison in this study because we have high titers of antibodies that we can measure. Then in the presence of neutralizing antibodies, you would expect that the virus would not get in and see a reduction in relative light units. So then the IgG pools, uh, here's a, just a, a gel showing the starting material here that is predominantly um, serum albumin. And after purification, these are several different preps, three different preps that we made. This, this band is actually not albumin anymore. It's, it's actually transparin, uh, but it's monkey transparent, and then the heavy chain and light chain, which you would predict. So it's not absolutely pure, but it's uh, certainly um, has no infectious particles, and it's very low or negative for endotoxin, which is, of course, not present in the starting material, but can be introduced in a laboratory setting. Just a little warning for those of you who might like to do this. And then these are graphs showing you the activity of the material that we made. And this is an important slide because it helps, I hope it will help you see, uh, the, the graph on the left is neutralization of SHIV SF162. Now this is the virus that we're infecting the animals with. And the graph on the right is the heterologous SHIV. And just as you would expect, the, material, the purified material behaves like the starting material in that the mismatched IgG neutralizes 89.6 very well and the mismatched IgG does not. And this vertical line indicates the um, level of the antibody in vivo after we infuse. So we, we predicted and we actually know this is the level that they got to. Um, and on the left, the important graph shows the mismatched IgG does have a little bit of activity against the, sh the challenge ship, but it doesn't really achieve 50%, whereas the matched IgG does, uh, does quite well um, against this virus, 75% um, neutralization at that dilution. And we um, added a component of IgG1B12, the very same antibody I described to you that has been so effective in uh, protecting animals at high doses and more recently at lower doses. And now we're talking about five, even five-fold lower than the amount that Anne Hessel and Dennis Burton tested in their most recent study last summer. So we mixed it 1 to 1,000 with the, the Shivik. And the rationale for doing this is that typically in an HIV infection, CD4 antibodies, CD4 specific antibodies, come up much later in infection. And HIV infected mothers would tend to have been infected for some time. And we, we wanted to have a, what we call a mature response that included this CD4 binding uh, antibody a little bit of CD4 binding antibody. So that's, that's what we did. And here is the outcome of the study. So we, we uh, measured uh, DNA viral loads and plasma virus loads. 
These are the four groups that I showed you in the cartoon of our expected outcomes. And you can see already that there was really not much difference. There's a little bit of a trend of lower PBMC infected uh, cells in the matched IgG, but it's not statistically different due to a few animals that seem to control on their own. We also had a few uninfected animals in this study. Uh, that's normal in a mucosal challenge. Uh, you can overcome that by IV uh, infection of the animals, but it's an interesting phenomenon, but we did not include these uninfected animals in our subsequent analysis. I'm sorry, Nancy. When yes. you say CD4 antibodies, you mean antibody recognizing the epitome on the virus that binds to CD4? Correct. Yes. Right. IgG1B12 no. binds to the CD4 binding site on the envelope protein okay. and thereby is able to neutralize many different viruses because that's a conserved region. Uh, we and others have done a number of studies to look at the proportion of C4, the occurrence of CD4 binding site directed antibodies but, as a component of neutralization. Yeah, but, but CD4 autoantibodies also arise in these patients. I mean, I remember studies a long time ago. Right? We don't know what their role is. Right. Mm -hmm. So more important to us was we had, we, we didn't know what we would get, but we actually did see a, dura a durable control of plasma viremia in these treated animals. And what's shown here are the normal IgG animals in black, the matched IgG in blue, and the mismatched in red. So despite the fact that there was uh, only a trend of lower PBMC-based virus, the plasma virus is much better controlled. This is a very pathogenic virus. These are very high levels of viremia in the plasma. And I think you can see that the, the uh, plasma viremia was delayed by a week in the two treated groups, but that it was only the matched group that actually controlled better than the other two uh, control groups. And uh, when we did statistical analysis of area under the curve, that also turned out to be the case. Um, so what happened to the antibodies in these animals? And here it gets pretty interesting to me. And this is when we turned to Don and asked him and Gary to work with us and figure out what was going on in these treated animals. So I know this is a very busy slide, but this is really one of the major take home points. So I wanna spend a little bit of time here. I've got three columns of data here and what are plotted are individual animals as a time course, tighter of binding antibodies on the left neutralizing antibodies in the middle, and ADCBI antibodies on the right. And uh, the different groups are the titration, again, the normal IgG, the mismatched, and the matched, again, in, in all the same orders that you've seen before. And I hope what is apparent to you is that although there's clear seroconversion in many of these animals, the ability to mount and develop neutralizing antibodies is very poor in these control groups, and also in the the mismatch group. There's, there were two animals that d did develop some neutralization. So it's possible that that material, the mismatch group, is partially protective in those animals. But with this small number of animals, we cannot say that that's different from the, the control groups. There's really no evidence of ADCBI coming up in the control groups, maybe a, a little bit in these animals, uh, again, these, these two animals. But it doesn't appear to be as strong as the responses in the matched group, and again, in the matched group, all these animals are rapidly developing neutralizing antibodies. This is what we predicted, and this is what we find really interesting. And at the same time, they made ADCVI uh, activity, and although there's, there are a couple of animals here under this curve, so that it's actually five out of six of these animals are responding. Um, uh, whether this is a consequence of just the uh, neutralization, we're not sure, we'd like to parse this out. But this is a new finding, it, um, and it's better than our SIV study because now we have all of the animals responding, and uh, this was uh, statistically significant. Uh, I just want to re remind you that the lower virus load also translated to protection of CD4 cells, and in this analysis shown here, I think if, if you recall some of the colors, these are the animals, these two animals are the ones in the control groups that had lower virus loads, and they're the ones that are maintaining their CD4 cells. No big surprise. Um, all of the rest of these animals have trended uh, down to this uh, valley of death uh, level of, of, of 200 to 250 um, cells per microliter of blood. Excuse me, this is a mistake. Uh, 
uh, whereas the, the uh, match group, while it is lower, it's tending to stabilize and to, um, we did lose one animal, but uh, probably because it dipped down at one time point. But these five out of six of the, these animals are, are normal and, uh, and looking good. So um, just to make that point again about the virus load, again, this is the, the pink animal and the light pink animal in these two control groups were the ones that had the, the normal CD4 counts. So the acceleration of, of neutralizing antibodies was then uh, graphed this way in terms of numbers of animals, the percent of the group that had decent titers of neutralizing antibodies. And we clearly show that, in the, obviously, in the beginning, we passively transferred, there's lots of material. And uh, by six weeks, there's not a lot of difference between these animals, but the rapid appear appearance of neutralizing antibodies shows up at week 16 and week 24 and is significantly different from the other groups. Excuse me. So to summarize then, um, this is the first demonstration, certainly in newborns, that physiologic levels of antiviral neutralizing IgG can have this effect. And we're seeing delays in acute viremia, control of plasma viremia for at least six months, that was the length of the study, and delay in C4 loss. Um, and importantly, this acceleration of the development of neutralizing antibodies and ADCVI activity. I have not described to you any cellular immunity. I know if you're waiting for this CMI, I'm sorry there isn't any in this presentation because these are newborns and we, we have very, very small samples. We are in the process of uh, designing studies in adult macaques that will help us uh, get at some of these, uh, the other um, sides of the immune response. Clearly, though, we think what is going on is that, that the overall adaptive immune response is saved or made better by this treatment. But we're proposing that uh, viral control and enhancement <coughs> of this acquired immunity is mediated in large part by maternal IgG. So this is a new idea. You know, what, in addition to actually neutralizing and preventing some of the transmission, it may actually be beneficial to have that IgG around, especially during those first few weeks of exposure in the baby, and whether that's controlling viremia to a very, very low level or limiting or preventing infection, we, we just don't know, and more studies are needed to figure that out. We, we did not see protection in, in the mismatched IgG, or at least not much, if any, and it suggests that the antibodies that are going to be effective against heterologous virus uh, in, a, in a heterologous setting, uh, not in the maternal to child transmission, but in, in a vaccine study, would need to be effective against heterologous virus. And um, I think, importantly, the amount of IgG is very low. So we're, um, su it suggests that this is a target for vaccines or treatments. Um, perhaps that what you could do is augment the mother's Shivik, or, or, or Hivik, I should say, uh, in infected mothers with, with a very powerful monoclonal. It might not take very much. You know, we may not need to go in with mega doses of monoclonals to actually make an effect. And to, this could be done in, in concert with drug treatment, which is uh, the current uh, standard of care where drugs are available. There are many places where drugs are not available, and as you probably are aware, there's significant risk of development of, of resistant variants in, the, in any drug treatment regimen, especially as uh, babies are, uh, uh, mothers are encouraged to, to nurse their babies. And wouldn't it be nice if you could, could give antibodies to uh, help in that situation. Um, so, so please. Those newborns were breastfed by SIV positive mothers or surrogate mothers? No, in, in our study, in our first study, we allowed the babies to be suckled by, by their mothers. In this study... And the mother was SIV? The mother was SHIV infected. Infected. Mm -hmm. In this study, the mother is out of the picture and the babies are not exposed to breast milk. So we have not addressed breast milk. I'm making a leap to say, in the HIV setting, where this might be applied, if it were to work in the HIV setting, there's potential for uh, giving babies low levels of monoclonals over periods of time, like was done in the Burton study, and potentially protecting against breast milk transmission. Protecting against breast milk. Mm -hmm. so that would I, know I was thinking the opposite. I was thinking about IgA ah, mm -hmm. in the breast milk, actually solving some of that effect. It, it might. Um, there's been a lot of effort to try to see if there's uh, IgA that uh, has antiviral activity 
with limited success, I would say. I think it's mostly IgG that does the work. Um, anyway, um, there's potential, we think, for vaccination of babies as well. And the goal here is to limit B cell dysfunction, which has been described in HIV-infected patients, the work of Susan Moore and, uh, and Tony Fauci's group, and uh, enhancing T cell function, which has been described by uh, Tetsuro Matano. So I just want to summarize with a couple of, of models of where we're, our thinking is going. So our one idea is very simple. There's neutralization in vivo. And what it's doing is allowing the immune response to, to respond and take over. And these are contrasting situations here on the left. You see the untreated situation where there's no antibody at the beginning. The virus diversifies and, and you get the loss of gold, hyper IgG, uh, slower um, re, uh, adaptive immune responses and dissemination of variants and uh, bad outcomes. And this line here is meant to show the neutralizing antibodies. In the presence of these antibodies, we're, we think that all of these consequences could be taken, taking place. But the real goal is to keep the virus load down. But in the, in the process of doing that, there's less T cell destruction. So we think much greater chance for normal T, cell, uh, T helper cells and um, normal IgG and rapid uh, adaptive immune responses. Another idea is that um, antigen presentation is enhanced by these neutralizing antibodies. We haven't blocked infection. There still is a peak of viremia. There is lots of antigen in these babies. What, what is going on in the presence of these neutralizing antibodies could be that the binding of the antibody, shown here, as deforming the envelope and, and thereby potentially exposing some of these conserved regions could well be very important for uh, better antigen presentation. And this could be a means of developing more rapid neutralizing antibodies. Uh, and there's evidence from Matano's uh, group um, in the paper they published uh, a couple of years ago showing um, um, in post-infection uh, SIV control and some evidence for um, in vitro uh, DC presentation and suggesting that this idea could uh, well have some traction. So finally, uh, just to wrap up, I, I think uh, what we want to do is to determine the active component in the polyclonal antibody mixtures. Um, of course, we need to parse out the role of the monoclonal that we threw into the experiment. Um, and we're in the process of doing that experiment right now. But we will also want to look at other broader monoclonals and ask what, what they might do. And, and of course, we want to know what the mechanism is of this accelerated response. We saw both neutralizing antibodies and ADCVI. And I forgot to point out when I showed you the ADCVI activity that we did not infuse the animals with ADCVI activity that we could detect. So they developed it, but, but the the IgG that we gave them didn't have much, if any. Um, what we'd like to do is clone monoclonals from infected animals and compare and discover what these antibodies are doing. You know, what is the repertoire, if you will, of, of the more rapidly developing antibodies? Um, we haven't addressed the issue of breadth. I'm just ignoring that for the moment, but it's obviously important. Um, and uh, we really want to understand this protection of B cells and enhancement of T cell responses. And again, from Matano, the Matano uh, published a paper last year showing that passive treatment um, was correlated with a better GAG-specific T cell responses. Uh, they, in their study, they did not look at the development of neutralizing antibodies, but they found uh, better T cell responses in passively treated animals. So I think this fits well with our thinking. And um, I know Tetsuro, we, we've been talking about potentially doing some work together. So. Um, and one more thing is, I did all these studies in pigtail macaques, and we're in the process of switching to rhesus, a, a specialization issue, but important since we only have rhesus at our center. So I just want to spend the last few moments thanking the wonderful people in my group uh, in Seattle and then ultimately in Portland who did this work. Uh, this work was the uh, doctoral work of two very talented students, Pushpa J. Raman and Sheree Ng. Sheree Ng is shown here, and this is Pushpa J. Raman. And uh, Bill Sutton, who has purified grams and grams and grams of antibodies over the years. Uh, I want to thank my colleagues at the Washington National Primate Research Center, and Julie Overbaugh and Barb Richardson and Dennis Burton, and uh, my lab group in uh, Portland. Again, Bill uh, is continuing, and uh, the new folks who are doing the new studies are Pablo Jaworski, shown here, this is from Argentina, and uh, Zach Brower.
uh, his tech, who's, uh, both of whom uh, have really made some exciting uh, new findings. Uh, of course, I want to thank Don and, and Gary uh, for participating, and, and we're looking forward to many more studies together. Uh, my new uh, animal colleagues at the Primate Center, and I want to thank our funding agencies for their support, and I want to thank you for your attention, and I'm sorry it's a little bit long. We don't on this study, um, to answer the second question first, because we, we only had funding to support those animals for a short time. Um, we were originally um, interested in, in looking at uh, tissue distribution of the viral variants, but it, and we have some data on that, but it, it turns out there's not um, enough difference in the, the infectious stock to allow us to really see statistical differences in the different uh, parts of the body. Um, so uh, my goal would be, in, with another study, would be to, to hold the animals longer. Uh, in our SIV study, we did see uh, controlled infection for five years in most of those animals. So, but again, there were just a few animals. Um, with regard to GALT, we have uh, samples from GALT, but we, we do not, we have not been looking at uh, any of the animals early on. They're extremely small, and we, we don't have a good ma machine. <laughs> to allow us to get samples from very tiny animals. So again, that would be something we could look at uh, at necropsy or, or later. Yes? You just briefly mentioned that you don't see a role for IgA. Can, can you uh, explain a little bit more? Um, I'm sure IgA is important. <laughs> I didn't mean to give it that short shrift. Um, in HIV, I think a couple of groups have um, attempted to determine whether breast milk has uh, IgA that has neutralizing activity in it. And um, the evidence is, is somewhat weak, in my view, um, so far, unless I've missed a paper um, that IgA is, is doing much in vitro. But we have no idea what it's doing in vivo. You know, we're in a situation today where we have evidence that a clinical trial for HIV has worked and there were very few, if any, neutralizing antibodies. And it's probably antibody-based. The TIE trial, the RV144 trial that was recently published, um, included a, a component that, that uh, elicits antibodies. I don't want to leave IgA completely, but just to say that um, we need to understand the functions of antibodies in vitro and in vivo much better. Um, you know, IgA certainly seems to be important or Breast milk seems to be very important for babies. Uh, there's a lot of IgG in colostrum, and probably IgA too. There's continuous production of IgA in milk. I don't know what its role is in HIV. I just don't know. And I think monkeys, it's too hard to study this in monkeys. We, we can't even really study subclasses yet. We're somewhat hampered by, by a couple of different areas. But I, I do think the models are useful for certain kinds of questions, and these, of course, are questions that you would not be able to, to answer in the clinic until we have definitive evidence that there's a, a benefit. But I think we're starting to see some potential. Any more questions? Well, thank you so much for coming.